you're not stuck with a brain you're born with whatsoever. Like absolutely every single person has unlimited human potential. It's just a choice of what you wake up and decide to do that day. How do you fill your brain? And then how do you reflect on what's filling your brain? And then how do you make different choices? From my perspective, retirement, it's not healthy. I mean, you see people who retire early on and what happens to them yeah. when they're not intellectually engaged. The longevity thing is so interesting because mm -hmm. reading a book called Lifespan with David Sinclair, and it's all about longevity. And his overarching thesis is that aging is a disease. So it isn't really about like, why do we waste money curing cancer? Why do we waste it curing AIDS, brain hemorrhage? Like all of these things, strokes, you name it. It's like, what if all of that was one disease and the disease was aging? You can get the same person and scan their brain in their 20s and based on their choices, you could look at someone have a completely different brain shape in their 30s based on the decisions that they've chosen to make. If you're not happy with a million pounds, you won't be happy with 10 million pounds because Quick question, when did you discover that you're a leader? That your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Dan, welcome to the show. So good to have you here. Thanks, Maria. Pleasure to be here. Yes. And I've actually gone for a walk just before here and I made it into a habit and all based on your advice. And of course, your own desire to go for a walk and get out. Yes, the intrinsic motivation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Not to go mad. But it's good to have the intrinsic motivation. But I think it's also good to be occasionally reminded and prompted by other people because mm. it's just the repetition that makes the difference. And I have to thank you for reminding me to do that because yeah. especially like during the pandemic not being like leaving the house and just doing everything here it's so so important yeah so. i think if i was ever to be an influencer around any topic it's arguably walk fluencer i was thinking is it the one thing that you decided that's going to be your thing about walking yeah so it's a good question do you know what i i the thing is i know that that is there's two sides i know scientifically that's the thing and I know from my own mental health, from my experience, mm. if I don't do it for one day, I'm so grouchy and I start to beat up on myself. Mm. So I've seen the evidence and the pandemic was a perfect example of it. Because actually pre-pandemic, you know, going into an office every day, you just do go for a walk. You don't think I'm going for a walk. You think I'm going to the office, but you do the thing that's really good for your health. So as soon as there's a lockdown, you realize what it's like to not leave your house all day. And it is just not pleasant for me. So... Um, I started to post occasionally, and then I was just like, I, other than my mum telling me I'm boring, um, I would just like just get a new shtick. I was like, I'm actually getting people telling me that me posting that I've gone for a walk has reminded mm. them to go for a walk, so it became a thing, which is quite funny. Mm. Um, but was never, I would never say it's like a trend that's gone viral because I'm aware that other people go for walks too. It's not, I'm not sure if it's necessarily, you know, it's not unique, but no. it's the it's the delivery of being very very. Consistent. In the moment yeah. and being consistent as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's definitely helped me. So and and mm. you know, it's my again. You if you live in London, it's such a great walking city as well, and you can walk most places. So especially when I was working in Soho, you know, I used to walk everywhere. If I had this meeting, I'd have walked to there. I mean, I did walk to this from Clerkenwell. Um, but if I can see, like most things are within an hour walk in London, if you generally work around town. Mm. So I'll never get public transport for that stuff. I'll just factor in how to yeah. walk there. Actually, you reminded me, I used to walk everywhere. And when I was at uni, which was in Nottingham, I used to do I the walk. Uni. You did? I did, I yeah. found that out the other day. Yeah, yeah. It's true. We must Great have... walking city. 
Yeah, so I used mm. to walk from Castle Marina to the university, mm. which is what, like a 45 minute walk in heels there wow. and back. <laughs> I never did heels. No? No. Well, I mean, I wouldn't obviously. recommend now. Yeah. No. On the, on the <laughs> old uni night, of course. One of the things that also you inspire me to do more of is reading. Mm. And I've actually read a few of the books that you recommend. So you're kind of like my book recommendation sort of guide. What's the one book that you come back to time and time again because this is something that Great you question. talk about a lot. Great question. Yeah. Again, if I was to be another thing, mm. if I was to be an influencer of two things, yeah, mm. I would love the second one to be reading because I do love reading. Well, Audible. I'm actually a very slow reader, very slow reader. I drive myself mad um, <laughs> at how... Um, I just, I find that I get so impatient reading an actual book. Mm. But Audible, on a walk, I love it. And so, you know, I found that's the thing that works for me. And I think when it comes to reading, find the thing that works for you. I know people who can't do Audible and they have to sit and stare at a book to absorb the information. So you ask what book I keep coming back to. I just restarted for the third time a book this morning. And I think three times is the most I've read any book before. Um, and I'm trying to I'm trying to pick a few books that I come back to regularly. So this one is A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. Mm. Um, and it, it's the only book that I've ever read in my life that I finished and started again immediately mm -hmm. um, in like the same sitting as well. It's not like I finished it and was like, cool, tomorrow I'll come back. I was literally straight back to chapter one as soon as I'd finished it and being like, God, I want to listen to that again. Mm. Um, that's how good I think it is. Mm. So I think if I had to, you know, I don't know that it's necessarily my favorite book of all time. I think it's quite hard to rank these things, but I feel a little bit like if there was one book I thought was very important for anyone to read and I had to pick one, I probably would pick that one. The book that I picked up was again by the same author and it's The Power of Now. Mm. And that was purely based on your recommendation. And I did read that again recently mm. as well. I have, rest I have restarted, but then I had kind of dropped all the books in favor of a holiday and being in the present moment. Yeah, very, very good, right? <laughs> you were living the practice instead of reading. Yes. Um, so it's interesting. A new earth um, is a bit like, if the power of now, the power of now is basically a chapter in a new earth, which I know is putting down the power of now considerably. But the interesting thing about the power of now, I mean, for starters, for anyone that's not read it, it's the most uniquely strange book in the whole world you'll ever read because it's basically a Q&A. So it's weird. It's like a really, really weird con concept of a book because you're like, how is this a book? It's just questions and some answers, right? From some smart guy. Mm. So I found that super hard to get on board with. And the first time I read it, I hated it as well because I was like, it's just too much. Who I think what he person? did really well is that he's asking questions that somebody who's very skeptical to the idea yeah. would be asking. And what I think also is clever is that he just goes around the same point. So it's not adding new information. It's just going yeah. and delving deeper and deeper into it. Totally. And it's quite a short book as yeah, well. Which it's is, very short. Yeah. And the depth of the one point mm. is mind blowing because you kind of think, okay, he's made his point. Mm -hmm. How much more is there really to this point? And the answer is a lot more. So I think it's a really great example of how deep you can go on an insight. Whereas a new earth is broad. So it's like, you know, the concept of the now is one point, but he comes back to, you know, it's an exploration in spirituality, how human beings should connect from families, kids, parents, with each other, different religions, different societies, the universe, you name it. He basically does the power of now um, insights, but across basically everything in the world. Mm. So it's a pretty intensely ingenious book. Mm. Um, that being said, he says something right at the start, which I think is so fascinating and is, is exactly what happened to me, which is that this book is either... Um, you know, he's, he actually says literally verbatim, this book is not interesting. An interesting book is one that makes you realize new things about the world or insights, whatever. This book is just a confirmation of what you already know within you. And whether you find it relevant or not depends on where you are in your life right now. And um, if you finish the book and it does open and awaken something within you, you were at the right time for it. And if it doesn't, it's very easy to disregard the book and find it like pointless. Mm. And I, I had exactly that experience, not with the new earth, but I had that experience with the power of now, which is the first time I read it. I was like, this is just wasting my time and it's junk and I absolutely hate it. And I read it a few years later and I was like, oh my God, this is so deep. Wow. And mm. I was in a very different place. I think what you were saying about 
you know, being consistent and also repetition and about saying something that you already know, there's huge power in that. We yeah. all really know what we need to do. Yeah. We just don't do it. Yeah. And it's more about how do you get people to actually change behaviors and do the things that we know mm. that we're supposed to do. And I think that's, that's where the real skill is. Yeah. And I think, you know, in all aspects of life, you really have two choices. You know, one is, do I go broad or do I go deep? And you can't do both. Like no one can go really deep on a whole range of topics. It's not possible. So whether it's a podcast or a book or a film, whatever the thing is, like you can cover everything and you can do it super well and it can be an exceptional piece of content or you can hone in on one thing to such a degree and that is an exceptional piece of content. But the way that people tend to mess this stuff up is by trying to go super deep and super broad because you're never going to cover um, enough depth for people that are really interested in any given topic. And anyone that's interested in that particular topic, you'll dive off too early and go on to another one they're not interested in. So you kind of lose out both ways. You say you read a lot. Well, you listen to Audible a lot. Is there a book in you? Is there something that you want to write about? Because you do a lot of content. You mm. did, you know, you have your newsletter, mm. your, you know, your LinkedIn posts are incredible. Thank you. Is there a book in you? I do write a lot and I have been asked actually quite a lot to do a book. Have you? Yeah, I've been approached mm. by three different people at Penguin, someone at, um, at HarperCollins. I had another one literally two days ago. I don't remember the publisher, but it was a big business publisher. And the thing is, and I did explore this for a while, um, the thing is I know, based, my philosophy is I don't want to put out something average. So there's an ego side, which is interesting because I actually know that the truth of the matter is if you want to put out a great book, like I'm always inspired, for example, by Mozart and Beethoven. Mo Mozart and Beethoven are the two best musicians of all time, arguably. Um, I mean, depending on your genre or whatever, but probably the most, you know, most famous musicians, let's say. And they're also the two most prolific musicians of all time. So, you know, they actually produced a whole lot of shit. And they produced, but within that shit are some of the best symphonies and compositions ever. So I think about that a lot because I am aware on the flip side, if I want to be a great writer, I should probably, if I think I could, you know, bring out some really interesting, relevant books, I should aim to write 10. And one of them will be an absolute smash hit. In reality, though, um, I've seen, I've got a lot of friends who've written books and I guess this is the thing at the higher end, right? So published by Penguin and, you know, international bestsellers and, like, you know, become well-known authors and very credible in their own right because of it. Um, that does two things for me. One, it puts pressure on me because, you know, um, psychologically comparison is the thief of joy, but I have very inspiring friends that do amazing things. And so I can't help but think, well, if I was to bring out a book and it absolutely, like, sunk, what would be the point? It would be embarrassing and like I don't really want to do that. And then the other side of it is I've actually seen how hard work they put into it. Um, the ones who have been really successful, actually, um, they weren't full-time doing their companies at the time um, or they weren't even business people, right? So we've got a couple of people who are more media celebrity type people anyway, who have gone it that way through creating top selling books and then become podcasters. And then it's a bit of a media empire. Um, and people who are business people, entrepreneurs, etc. but they weren't full time running their company. They were taking a couple of years out to find space and write in between. And so I think it's a really easy, um, an easy thing to get caught up in the in your own hype for starters, but also the hype of, oh, people want me to write a book that's really flattering, I should do it, versus it's insane how hard these people work to put their books out. Mm. Like they worked really hard. I know they worked hard because I spoke to them regularly about it and they had unbelievable discipline as well about how they were doing it. One took himself to Bali for a few months, did that twice. Another one did like, you know, three weeks, no phone in a cabinet, like that kind of stuff. And it's like, I couldn't possibly do that right now. Like what on earth would I say to my team? Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think very practically about, is there a book in me? Yes. Do I have to, do I feel like I have to achieve a certain thing by a certain time? If I was honest with myself, I'd say, yes, I do have that narrative in my head, but mm. the real side of me is like, I'd actually much rather um, give focus to the most important thing 
that I have to offer the world currently. And I believe that that is heights. And so, you know, I've stacked my opportunities in my head. You know, there's always stuff that comes at you. I get offered public speaking, for example, all the time. And I always say no. Um, I haven't done a public speaking gig in, I don't know, well over a year, maybe two years. And the reason is because that time, even though not much time, once you start to say yes to that, you say yes to another one and it's a few. And all of that stuff stacks up being two to four hours of your day that you could have been working really hard in your business and making a big impact. And I do massively buy into compound interest theory, right? So I'm trying to actually figure out how can I compound my impact at heights as much as humanly possible because that's probably going to get the biggest impact in the world for where I am right now and I truly believe that that will make a bigger impact than a book would so I think about this stuff sort of in um five-year periods so to speak so I, I kind of think okay well in five years I'll be 40 and 40 feels like you know uh often misunderstood decade it's still really young, but I guess considered to be like old, like by younger people. So it's like a weird thing, right? Because it's like, you know, that it's actually really young, your 40s. Like, of course it is. And professionally, if you look, almost all of the most successful things that anyone does in their career happen between 40 and 60. Um, so those are actually like your golden years. They're technically the start of your actual career. So if you think about most famous people with your outliers, forget your outliers, your Evan Spiegels and your Mark Zuckerbergs and stuff. Most famous people we're mostly aware of making a really big impact in the world. They do it in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. So I think of all this stuff as like, don't rush and be that young cocky guy that's like bringing out something prematurely before he even understands the world. Focus on the thing that will make an impact. Once I've done that, I can take some space and I can think about how I want to formulate those thoughts into content that's ready to be shared and, and can be valuable. Mm. Um, and a younger me would have just being like, well, whatever, I can just stick out a book anyway. But I know that it would have been average. And I know that that would have really disappointed me. It's a very long winded an answer. I could have just said no. Well, I'm really pleased what you're saying about 40s because I've just reached my 40th right. birthday. So Happy birthday. Thank you. Well, a couple of months ago. But um, I'm really glad that it's not the end of the road. And I think How do you feel? I went through a bit of a shift. And I don't know if it's to do with having kids followed by a pandemic or whether it's age related, because I didn't have this when I was 30. In fact, I felt this, I was just kind of getting started. It felt, it felt really right at that point. Mm. And I think as a result of possibly the pandemic and the kids, like your career kind of takes a backseat, mm. but I didn't have that in my head. So my expectation was to still go at the same pace. Mm. And yet a lot of it wasn't really kind of living up to my expectations. So mm. I think I just mm. went through a little shift. Mm. But age-wise, I think now there are more role models in terms of what it means to be 40 than there were before. Mm. So after that little kind of niggle, I feel good about it again. So yeah, it's good. We've got yeah, lots to look forward to. <laughs> I think the longevity thing is so interesting because I was mm -hmm. reading a book uh, called Lifespan with David Sinclair, and it's all about longevity and um, his overarching thesis is that aging is a disease so it isn't really about like why do we waste money curing cancer why do we waste it curing aids brain hemorrhage like all of these things strokes you name it it's like what if all of that was one disease and the disease was aging mm -hmm. because if you were to look at it in a very different way obviously a lot of people think he's, he's mad for positioning it this way but he says but if you look at the data in a certain way you could arguably say the risks of you getting all of these diseases in your 20s, 30s, and 40s are very, very low. But in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, etc., well, and then 80s and 90s, it goes exponential, the likelihood of you picking up all these diseases increases dramatically. So therefore, arguably, aging is the disease, and what's really happening is your cells are deteriorating one way or another, and that is a biological process that doesn't have to happen at the same speed for everyone and there are a lot of things that you can do and he talks a lot about supplements he talks a lot about nutrition um but you know it's a really interesting theory anyway his his daughter um is really anti him doing this because as you might imagine she's a gen z and she's very much like you know you dinosaurs should just die out because you've ruined the world for us etc <laughs> etc et um whereas his point of view which is really fascinating like i said the way that he debates this with his daughter is most of the 
true scientific breakthroughs um, come actually from exceptional experience from people in their 60s, 70s, 80s. And then, you know, we don't really know about 90s and 100s and 110s because people's brains deteriorate so much that they can't really work. So his whole theory is, well, actually, and, and obviously there's also the way that we treat people in society, encouraging retirement at 65 Whereas, like, actually, in scientific communities, it's like definitely your golden years. Mm-hmm. Like, you've just worked for about forty years in the in the field of science, which is basically repeating principles over and over again until you get some kind of breakthrough. You're already patient. You already know the principles. Imagine adding twenty or thirty years of insight and experience on top of your forty, but instead you put them out to pasture and ask a whole bunch of 27 year olds to like start Mm. again is that the literally is illogical for progress so his whole um you know overarching argument on longevity and why it's important to help humans live to for example 150 is because all the lost brain power from call it your 60s when it starts to deteriorate a little bit more and actually how many breakthroughs you could have. You know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, people like Thomas Edison invented like electricity, light bulbs, like all these things, you know, you can, true human ingenuity can be magicked up at any second. Mm. It just can. And so, you know, solving the environmental crisis, one argument is obviously if humans are living so long, overpopulation is the problem and therefore resources are the problem and therefore the world dies. His argument is, or one scientific genius is all it takes to discover the new renewable fuel or the new thing that will save all of mankind and solve all of these problems. So you should be encouraging people to have healthy brains, fully functioning minds for as long as possible and encouraging them to have longer careers that also helps them with their mental health and their Mm -hmm. um, personal fulfillment, right? So I guess a bit of a tangent, sorry. No, but what you were saying, but I think that's really interesting because I spoke to Daniel Pink Mm. about this topic in terms of like the age of retirement and, you know, and my thinking was, is that, well, it's it's a relic of the industrial past mm-hmm. where you know there's a lot of physical labor so if your your work requires you to you know strain yourself physically then of course at some point you know we need to be retiring and i think that comes down to having the sort of 60 65 but a lot of the work now especially in the you know rich west mm. a lot of the work that we're doing is intellectual which is using our our brain so mm. to speak and the type of work is different. And what's really interesting is that you're saying that there are studies that are showing that past a certain age, you know, scientists come up with, you know, breakthroughs Mm. and it does take a long time to, you know, get get that experience, but then also to be able to connect the dots and to continue. And from my perspective, retirement isn't really, it's not healthy. I mean, you see people who retire early on and what happens to them when they're not intellectually engaged and i think if you want to retire fine Mm -hmm. but and i understand it but a lot of people would not choose to retire and are made to retire which is really silly Mm -hmm. and you know i think about my own grandpa like he worked until he was 93 Mm -hmm. and that is definitely what kept him young and and staying alive Mm -hmm. like full stop Mm -hmm. i know that is as soon as he stopped going into the office, he died pretty quickly afterwards. Mm-hmm. I know there's like causation correlation is an old person, but you know, I saw someone categorically staying young in the mind and attitude, you know, at, at 93, he had more going on for him than most 65 to 70 year olds who've been retired for a couple of years that I was also meeting. It just, it gives you a sense of purpose. I mean, in my own life, when I see people Maybe who- Maybe you're not 93, right? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> just checking. You said, uh, I remember my 40th, so I just wanted to double check. Yes, yes. That was only a couple of months ago. <laughs> but um, in my experience, watching, observing other people, I definitely see that. Those who continue on and who have a purpose, who have something to work towards, and maybe it's not quite a job, but something that is day in, day out, that you know you have to stretch yourself, you have to use your, mm. your brain to be able to do that. They certainly do live longer and more high quality life. For you, where does the interest in health come from? Because when I knew you, mm. well, first of all, you had a different name mm. to which we'll come back to. Yeah. And two, you were running a fashion tech startup Gravel. So mm. there's a big sort of twist of um companies and just sort of you know changing changing industries mm. 
which I also want to talk about. But where did the interest in in health and wellness, where did that come from for you? Um, The interest in health and wellness came from growing up fat and having and not being that interested in health and wellness and having a dad who was super sick Mm. all the time. Not necessarily, you know, some of them his own fault from lifestyle and some of them, you know, genetically predisposed and very unfortunate. So he died when I was younger. He was he died about 10 years ago or pretty much exactly 10 years ago. And so, you know, I was in my early 20s having lost a dad and like reflecting on why. And it really got my ass in gear to get fit. Like that was as simple as that. So I became really interested in health and wellness. And, you know... Um, my dad had spent, you know, my whole adult life basically in and out of hospital, constantly trying to, um, you know, solve the problem from the new thing that he got that was caused by the other thing that he got. But so much of this just triggered from a bad lifestyle and being really overweight, having to do emergency diets, which are impossible to stick to. And, you know, kind of the insight came to me very clearly from what I was seeing, which is that, you know, prevention is the only cure like you my dad you know had private insurance you know so he's going into like all the best hospitals and best doctors and all this kind of stuff and all they're really doing is another band-aid on another band-aid but like beyond that your quality of life is just consistently diminishing and so I watched someone who had made lifestyle choices throughout his life to totally YOLO right? Eat what he wants, enjoy life. You know, my dad had an amazing joy de vivre, but I think you can have a joy de vivre. Ironically, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. Just don't eat the cake. Um, (laughs) Just a little bit of once in a while. Yeah, slice. And this is the thing. And like, you know, um, everything in moderation Mm -hmm. is my uh, attitude ever since. And I actually think, you know, well-being and wellness in my, my view of it is everything in moderation, which means, you know, I don't really believe in totally fad diets. I don't believe in cutting out everything. I believe for most people, and there are extreme people that can do all of the things. And usually the things you see on social media are from the people in extremes. They've got the amazing asses, the flat abs, the massive chests, like all that kind of stuff. And it's like, it's great, but they're basically catering to like the 1% of the 1% of people that have immense willpower or that's their job. That's literally their job. That's how they make money. For most people who don't make money by looking good, like the reality is you default back to a whole bunch of everyday habits. So if you make your everyday habits moderate and healthier than they are bad for you, and you just sort of stack up some common principles that can fit into your lifestyle without being a total stress, then I think you end up like compounding upwards rather than compounding downwards. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of my insight at the time from my dad, which is that I don't think I have to go maniacal about stuff, but I can certainly improve a lot of things that I do. I can take more interest in what I'm putting into my body and I can make more conscious decisions both around my physical and my mental health. And so, you know, the other thing is that stuff is like osmosis. So if you want to get healthy realistically find some people to hang out with who are generally more interested in health than they are in other things don't have to be all your friends but if you've got no friends who are healthy it's really hard for you to be inspired as well so you hang out with people who are a bit healthier you find you find social media accounts and you follow them and again i'm not talking about just following models and stuff but you know this process of osmosis or even neuroplasticity right what you are consuming i call it your social media diet like what you're consuming and what you're basically feeding your eyes and therefore your brain all the time is also a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you're choosing to read books about health and wellness, if you're choosing to, you know, consume media about it, if you're choosing to follow, you know, healthy, well-adjusted people that don't put out necessarily toxic, I'm not suggesting you should follow the Kardashians, but you know, if you follow people who don't necessarily have toxic wellness personalities or, or messages they share, you find relevant people to share, you know, listen to podcasts that are about health and wellness. And I'm not saying do this all the time. I'm saying just integrate some. And suddenly you're learning your, you know, if you think about what most people do, they follow interests usually around their career. So whatever career you're in, if you're not in health and wellness, you will tend to gravitate towards things that are going to make you more money. And what makes you more money is being really good at your job 
and 10xing your career. So most people go we're all in on that and that's a very, very good decision. But what I started to do, and this is back when I was running Gravel, was making sure that some of the information that I'm consuming is about my health and wellness. Mm. Because if I don't have a fit body and if I don't have a fit brain, I will absolutely limit the potential that my career can go on full stop. And I saw it with my dad. I saw him in and out of hospital for months at a time. That's not great when you're trying to earn money. And it's definitely not great when you're trying to run a company because you can't do jack shit at those points. Mm. So, you know, it was great to have a surprising role model in that, you know, that there's so much that my dad role modeled for me that I absolutely follow as best practice humanity. Um, and there are some personal habits and certain personal behaviors that role modeled exactly what you shouldn't do. And mm. so I try to avoid those. Mm. Were you really close with your dad? Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. like definitely my best friend. So we spent all of our time together. And so it was very difficult because he is, he was also a very, very inspiring person and very funny. So life and soul of a party and everyone really liked him, but he was blind as well. So he had, um, you know, he like ever since I was a kid, you know, we had a very um, symbiotic relationship, so to speak. Like the parent-child relationship wasn't reversed because I was still a child, mm -hmm. but our responsibility of like, you know, going to the shops with my dad was like me taking him to the shops. Right. And, you know, it's, it was kind of unusual so you were maturity. almost like a carer for him to yeah. some extent. To some yeah, extent. I mean, of yeah. course. Yeah, to, like, mm -hmm. to the extent. I mean, my dad was, you know, as independent as anyone wants to be, but there are limitations to that. Mm -hmm. That You know, it's a opportunity of dissolving your ego as well because all, all humans want the autonomy to, like, stand with pride and stuff, but like, you just learn if you have a serious disability, like you don't have sight, you learn what to let go of mm -hmm. and accept help. And I think it's another really interesting thing for me is, you know, I always observed that as a really positive thing. I think lots of people really struggle to accept help. Um, everyone's very stoic. And I think stoicism is very important. Again, read lots of stoicism, think it's great. I think it's another perspective of the world that's very helpful. I also happen to think that most people are, not most people, but certainly a lot of Gen Zs, um, particularly, you know, very sensitive um don't take feedback well don't take criticism well at all i think all of that stuff is toxic and terrible for them um and i think you know that plays into social media cancel culture all the stuff i absolutely hate all of it i think it's terrible for society but and and, and awful for individuals let alone society i think it's an awful thing for you personally to be super offended when someone tells you the truth about yourself um that will never be good. They'll never go well for you over the long term. However, um, people do shut down that stuff quickly. And like also part of this stuff with the stoicism is and people can um, find it hard to accept help. Um, asking for help is quite an impressive thing to do. Um, underrated, it's like an inverse thing. People think that asking for help is super weak. It's actually quite strong. It's quite a good show of strength, shows quite good confidence that you know that you don't know this thing, you'd like someone to help you. And actually, you know, I read a quote somewhere that, you know, words to the effect of, it's actually one of the most generous things you can do for someone else because most people have an intrinsic desire to help. So most people want to help and they'll get a kick out of helping you and they'll do it well, but you tell them you don't want their help all the time. And so they feel rejected. And that's not what you meant to do at all. You just wanted to show that you were strong and you don't need the help. And so it's this whole dance of absurdity. So with my dad, I learned very early on, you know, to ask for help, to not feel silly about asking for help and to accept help. And I think that's really helped me build strong relationships with people where, you know, I don't have to, as you know, you follow me on LinkedIn, I don't have to pretend everything's going well all the time. Like really mm -hmm. happy to say, hey, it's not. Um, here are some things that could help. I think that what's impressive that you were able to do is being so transparent and open about things. And, you know, one of the company principles is sharing and you know being very transparent about what's going on in the business mm. when did you decide to do that and why yeah so when the last company failed very clearly um i thought well first thing joel and i did so joel's my co-founder first thing we did was we kind of did a post-mortem and we actually um we actually we worked with a couple of psychologists and we pretty much 
created a space to complain to each other, get it all out on the table. So, so this was deliberately for you, it was almost like a counselling yes. for the founders. Yeah, it was okay. basically post breakup therapy. It wasn't marked as that and it wasn't quite so strategically thought through as that, but it's basically what it became mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. um, and was like all really helpful part of a process because we were like, you know, should we work again together? Um, if you've just failed, there's really two ways to look at it. And we actually had the completely opposing views. So Joel was like, we should work again together because the hardest thing to, the hardest thing to build in any relationship is trust. And we definitely have that like one way or another, we've just been through the worst thing that can happen, which is ultimate failure. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're still friends. So like objectively we can do the trust thing. Don't know if I can find the trust thing with anyone else and neither do you. The rest we could probably develop and work on and grow. Whereas I was like, you know, we're two people with different skills and we've just tried to do something over multiple years and it failed. It seems kind of dumb to go again. Us two. Why like, did it fail? Um, I mean, business model is the easiest answer. Um, it was a great product, a decent brand and terrible business. So the without getting into the whole details of, of, of fashion and the Grabble model, like it was, we never ever figured out how to actually make like a gross profit in like a meaningful way. And part of that is absolutely like how we set up, you know, listen to our investors about just grow and we really did grow. And so the things that we could do well, we did really well, which was product and growth. But the one thing that matters, which is margin, and can you actually, is this a business? Um, those things were basically pushed aside. Um, we knew that they were being pushed aside. It's not like we were short-sighted short -sighted and had no idea and blindsided by this reality. Um, but, you know, we always anticipated what our investors said, which is as long as you're growing, you'll raise more money and you'll be able to get out of the situation. And actually that is not what happened. Like we struggled to raise money without being able to meaningfully show like growing margin. And so in the end, we tried like a whole bunch of different things. But I mean, fashion is brutal, as you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's brutal on margins and it's brutal on how people get paid and what people will pay. And it was just a nightmare. And actually in the end, you know, I just totally fell out of love with that space as well. Um, you know, I said earlier, when you work in an industry in a space, you do consume all the news and the media and you go to the events and the industry magazines and stuff. Like at some point I just like switched off. Mm -hmm. I just like, I got to a point where I just didn't care. I didn't want to read anything about fashion anymore. I was like, turns out maybe I'm not as interested in this as I thought I was. And so that was challenging. And then there was the tech side as well. And I'm like, well, maybe I'm really interested in like the tech crunch side and all that stuff. And I'm like, I don't know, got quite limited levels of interest and like deep care to read about this stuff in like the same cycle over mm -hmm. and over again as well. So what was going through your head when you realized that you are not interested in this anymore? Uh, well, I had a conversation with Joel. So, mm -hmm. and I always remember it because um, we went to a founder weekend in Stockholm and we, we did these like, you know, just like weekends away to talk about how the business is going and all that kind of stuff. And we were in Stockholm and I, you know, I just remember being on like a little archipelago, I think I said that correctly, um, a little island basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just sitting there being like, you know what, I just, I just, we were doing a strategy of the next couple of years and I was looking at it and I was like, I just don't think I can do that. It just like, look at that and my my soul sinks mm. and I was like that's a really like bad place to be really as a founder like I should look at that with excitement and I just can't and it's hard because you know when you're building a company first couple of years are going to be amazing next couple less amazing next couple less amazing like broadly speaking like you know at some point the excitement's going to wear off and you're just going to be running any old business one way or another with the same problems which are usually which is why you're in business, people. Um, and so, you know, it's it's all kind of the same in theory, but I don't necessarily think that you should look at what you have to do and feel like gutted that you dread. have to do it. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> mm. dread. And that's what I felt. So great thing about having a really good business partner, right? I was able to really communicate that very clearly. Um, I even said at the time that I would give you most of my equity to just walk away if that's basically what I need to do over the next couple of years because I just don't think that I can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, these things are all catalysts. 
So we had two leadership psychologists basically working with us. Um, you know, we got it all out on the table and saying, you know, what didn't work, what did work, what we do like about our partnership and what we don't. And in the end, you know, we we did personality profile matches and it was interesting because you could see in some spaces. Which one did you do? It was a very, it was actually a very bespoke one. It wasn't like a sixteen personalities or Myers Briggs. It was like a was it a disc? Yes, I think it was disc. Yeah, actually. I'm a huge fan. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the type that psychologists have to do with you holding your hand um, and explain all of the things. Mm-hmm. Um, and we could see some areas. I mean, basically, they both rung true, as in we both recognised all of the things that came up on there as you would. But we could both see. Oh, these are our places that where we completely agree and these are the things where we're so completely opposite mm-hmm. um and that enabled us to spend time thinking about okay well what do we want to do next you know the first thing that we did was we wrote our company values based on where our values on our personality tests had matched and crossed over it's a really really good exercise which was here are all the problems get it all out in the open what are our personalities what are we drawn to how does that help and then we did like a whole exercise on like, you know, writing down different values and things based on our own personalities, um, really being able to discount someone else's suggestion of a value by actually saying, hey, but if you look at my personality, like, of course, I don't care about that. So if mm-hmm. we're going to find some alignment on values that we both will live and breathe, which is when values become so valuable in a company because you, you really mean them because you haven't just plucked them out of thin air, we should both be able to point to the fact that we strongly think that these are character traits of ours. Um, and that whole process, like basically started our, um, our journey. We had, um, three company values and all of the interview questions written out. What were the values? So they've changed, we've developed them with the team Mm -hmm. ever since. But the first ones that you, you came up with. The first ones were keep a sense of humor and humility. Um, there was, uh, a joking one, which was, have you checked Google? Um, but it <laughs> Good was me- one. <laughs> yeah, but it was meant to be take the initiative. Mm-hmm. Um, Don't bother me with things you can find out yourself. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the third one was uh, care without compromise. Um, and care without compromise and humor and humility have stayed. We have a less passive aggressive version of, uh, <laughs> of, of have you asked Google, which mm-hmm. is grow for it. I mean, the intention is always the same, right? Which is like, we don't want to work with people who ask you questions that they can Google mm-hmm. because as any founder will tell you, like their first go-to is Google as well. Like we don't know how to do anything like an entrepreneur's, you know, I said to you, you can go broad or deep, like entrepreneurs, generally speaking, can't go deep because you have to be jack of many, many trades. So you learn how one thing connects with the other, connects with the other, connects with the other, and you have to be able to hire people into the role and explain how things go. But, you know, if you can do that role deeper than the person you've hired, then you probably hired someone not very good, or you've spent way too long in that thing and probably not long enough in you know, the broad things you need to work on. Mm. So, um, yeah, so uh, those are our three values. And the fourth one that we've added is build trust and be trusting because mm. we, um, we identified quite early on with what we do, the brain supplements, what are the sentiments? Like, well, everyone thinks that supplements are scams and don't work. It's broadly true. And also in the brain space, like anyone actually wanting to trust you, um, but you're not a neuroscientist, you're just an entrepreneur. It's like very clear to us that trust is going to be like a big thing. So we're like, well, you know, how can we instill values in our company and in our people that are all based around trust? So we've got those those three values now for and set out all of our interview questions. And we didn't hire anyone for about 14 months, but it was really handy because you get stuck into startup mode and stuff is manic, like horrifically manic to there's a million things every single day on the top you do so list. many jobs so many and all and such a rush mm-hmm. um and trying to work towards like a launch schedule as well so it just gets so crazy um and then you're coming around to like needing to hire people and actually you know one of the i just always remember one of the most relieving feelings ever was like at least we have a really clear idea of who we want to hire values wise mm-hmm. at least we don't have to like be like, oh, we need to hire these people. Like, how do we know if they're the right people? Well, we already did this exercise job. We spent ages on this. We spent like a month pretty much, like way before we started, really honing in on our values, our traits, our questions. So that was extremely helpful. And we still use them today. Do you have a process for hiring? Yes, um, but it's always changing, obviously. Um, but yes, we have a process. So Generally speaking, the first call is a values call um, and it's with another colleague. 
Um, so they always do the values call and we have like a variety of like, you know, tell me about a time when classic, uh, the classic interview questions. Um, and then we have uh, a call with the like hiring manager and that's more about like getting to know each other, like understanding, you know, what the job is. If they have questions, then there's a work task. And then if, if need be, there's a final, final meeting or interview with the, with our, like the founder mm. or one of us. And how do you know when you found the right person? I think it's a great question. Sometimes you do know. So sometimes you do know. And in my experience, let's think about this for a second. It's a good question. Because, you know, it's really interesting. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've had the, as every founder has, I've had the whole range of finding the perfect person and then they weren't perfect. Finding the not that perfect a person and being blown away by how great they are. Um, and so I think probably the correct answer is you don't know. Mm. And you definitely get more cynical on your hype, your own hype narrative to yourself, that is. Mm. I've definitely got more cynical as I've interviewed more people. So as soon as I'm like, oh my God, this person is the best person ever, I always tell myself, okay, but we don't really know that. Like, mm. you know, it's going to take ages to realize that. Um, and, you know, there are, if I think about like three or four of the best people that I work with at Heights, like I, they actually weren't the people that I 100% knew. Like, you know, I was like, I think they're pretty good. So are these other people. It wasn't like, oh, they're 100% like so that's the candidate. So because you didn't have the feeling with those people... What then made you choose them? The process mm -hmm. is the answer. So we do have a scoring process. Um, so everyone has a scorecard. Um, we all go off the same scorecards. As you can pick different questions from values to work tasks and stuff, everyone has scorecards. And ultimately we use those scorecards to actually have internal conversations about, okay, who are we hiring and why? And you can see when you go down the scorecard, you know, this person, you know, if you're trying to say, look, they were really nice and they were funny and all this kind of stuff, you can look at their scorecard and see if other people noted, you know, humor and humility as a value. For example, you know, we don't want to work with any brilliant dickheads as well. So like, that's like yeah. a big thing for us is like, if all is said and done, the number one thing that we always draw back to is humility. So we're like really careful that, you know, and it's just hard because also we're higher Americans now in, in America and there is very hard to find in America, an American with humility. It's an oxymoron. Um, so that can be tricky because they're, they're amazing at everything, of course, if you ask them. Um, so they definitely know how to sell themselves or at amazing. least the, the, the ones that I, that I have. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. The flip side of this, I just say is, you know, you, I mean, they're pretty competent. I mean, the competent ones are actually like, to be fair on a whole other level. Um, and I, I've had that experience. I really have like, you know, we went to hire, um, you know, senior people in a senior role for the U S and the candidates were another level from what I've been interviewing and in the UK and it wasn't all hubris. It was, you know, ridiculous overachieving stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best in the role and all the things, but you know, there is there is always that level. It's really complicated as an Englishman hiring a, an American because you're like, I know that you're going to tell me you're amazing. I can't, I can't really say that you're not because I can clearly see that you are and you've got exceptional experience and you seem like a really nice person to boot. But I can't really work out what I'm meant to be feeling here. So yeah, mm. I can, I'm, I'm still, still learning this. I think it's interesting that you said about having had the experience of having that feelings like this is the one, this is the one, and then them not turning out to be that way. Mm. And one of the things that I, that I have to catch myself, and I suppose this has also been the training where if you get so excited about someone, you kind of have to like reel yourself back in. Mm. It's like, why am I so excited about this person? Mm. I probably like them. Mm. I probably get on with them or yeah. have shared like, you know, similar experience. Yeah. And then you kind of have to rein yourself back and start asking difficult questions yeah. because it's very easy to just be like, they're great. Let's just sort of skip the process. And likewise, when you don't feel that for someone, you have a tendency, this is the bias that we all have to kind mm. of dig more or ask kind of tricky questions, which, you know, you probably wouldn't do that with yeah. somebody who is, you know, so amazing in your eyes. And that's, 
amazing for you to have that self-awareness to be able to kind of like rein it in yeah. and then fall back on the process, which I don't think I mean, most the, founders yeah. do. We need the need the process because my bias always comes in. Mm. And I do have the self-awareness to know this is my bias and that's really helpful. And that's why, again, the scoring keeps you honest. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the bias that you're... Um, I'm saying you're mine. Sometimes my bias that comes out in these interviews because I like someone and I want to hire them and I basically want them to say the right answers. So I'm kind of like accidentally and I'm kind of aware, but it is basically spontaneous, you know, nudging them towards a better answer or the thing <laughs> I want them to say. Yeah. But it doesn't actually fit in the scorecard process because mm -hmm. it wasn't one of the questions. So it's like, oh, cool. I really actually... They said the perfect thing, but then I have to present the scorecard and the rationale to other people and it doesn't actually go in there because it doesn't fit the thesis. And that's mm -hmm. actually quite a good way to catch yourself out as a founder. Yeah. One of the things you said earlier about having focus and just being intentional where you split your time when you mm. were talking about, you know, having a podcast mm. and having your business. How do you make a decision? What's going to be your focus? Do you have a process for that? No. You made me think that maybe I should. No, I think it's the, my my view is, so I have three companies technically that I'm basically, that I'm a co-founder director of. So therefore I have fiduciary responsibilities, et cetera. And so, and two of them started before Heights. And so when Heights came up, I sort of had a decision, which is like, you know, do, um, do I want to do 50-50, 33-33-33? Um, or do I want to do like, a, you know, some version, some variation of that? Um, I think the thing with Heights, because I'd had um, a personal experience with my mental health, because I had insomnia and depression, and then was basically given supplements by a dietitian and had my whole experience inverted and this whole surprise moment. And it was so, so meaningful to me. And I think that's kind of it. That was such a I thought I was never going to not have insomnia and I kind of also thought I was never going to not be depressed. So because that had had the most life-changing impact on me, that was by far and away the thing I was so excited about. It's hard to find something that you really care about in life. Like, it just is. You know, I've been through the startup experimentation phase so many times. You basically just tinker away and after a while you tell yourself you really like the thing but you know maybe time goes on turns out you didn't like the thing so much and you have to sell yourself a new narrative and these narratives are really powerful but they're important for you whereas this was an undeniable experience that i had had that had basically improved my life so much that i was all in on trying to bring more of that to the world and if i thought about that compared to the other stuff i was doing i was like i mean it doesn't even pale in comparison like it's not you know, creating a podcast is important because content's important because it's uplifting and it helps people. But I just didn't feel like I could make the same kind of impact with what I knew so far about podcasting. And also my, my you know, my interest in podcasting anyway was kind of, you know, ultimately self-serving, which is I interview really top entrepreneurs that I can't have a copy with because they would say no. So, you know, it's always been my way of just getting basically free and cheap mentoring mm -hmm. um, and then publishing it to, uh, you know, lots of listeners. And that was my life hack. Um, but that life hack was always meant to be in pursuit of helping me build a really great thing myself. So that's the way that I saw this. I thought that is like the funnel that helps me, gives me unofficial mentors for all the different challenges I might face at any point in my journey. Mm. But I really want to go and swing for the fences again. Like that is what I tried to do with Gravel. It failed. I had loads of good lessons and loads of good things that I learned about what I would do better the next time. This time in health and wellness, I had the, the lessons and the experience of the things I would do better, but I also had the fact that I really cared about it. So I guess for me, it never really came down to a system for how I choose what I focus on. I do know that if I did 50% at heights and 50% between the other businesses, um, I'd be doing myself a disservice. You know, if I think in terms of impact, which is basically volume of customers, and then volume of customers have like that become lifetime customers because they're clearly the ones that are getting the most impact. Otherwise, why would you become a lifetime customer? Um, that's the most motivating North Star in my head. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the rate of speed of hitting that North Star, so being able to impact a thousand brains, then ten thousand brains, and a hundred thousand, a million, you know, that all slows down. Not by 50%, if I put in 50% of the work, probably on an exponential scale, slows it down 
exponentially slowly too. Um, not that, you know, I make such an impact at work that I can't be covered like by my colleagues, but it just was like the way that I was framing things in my head. You know, I, if I really care about something, I want to give it my all. Um, even now, I spend two hours a week doing my secret leaders interviews. And even then I'm like, I could be doing something for heights right now. It's just in my head. Mm. So do you feel like it's your calling? Uh, it's a good question. And I don't know the answer. And the reason I say that is because I feel like um, there's a really interesting like thoughts that I have on like passion and purpose. So I think your passion is for you and your purpose is for others. And so in this sense, it's a bit of a both passion and purpose. Um, I do, I guess, because I am so passionate and interested in this space, it can feel like it's my calling a lot. However, I'm aware of two other um, motivations within me. And one is that I love the idea of starting something new totally. Like one of the coolest things for me about Heights is that my last business, you know, for a long time, it was a very well-known company and I was that guy in that fashion company. And now I'm not. It took a while, but like now I'm that guy in that health company. Um, I think it's really interesting to think, okay, well, what would I be next? And I like starting from zero. I like learning how, and that's a really good way as well to do something different in an industry is to start from zero. Um, so there is, an, uh, there is a part of me that's like, you know, every decade, pretty much, I'd like to try something completely new. a completely new space, reinvent myself, reinvent what I know about it and see what I could create. I definitely love building a consumer brand. So I would definitely be interested in staying in consumer brands. Um, but I'm really interested in like a few other spaces. I'm really interested in psychedelics. I'm really interested in, um, anything to do with pets, love, love animals. Um, and I'm like absolutely, you know, whatever the peak of fascination could be. I, I just love spirituality enlightenment, not that I'm enlightened, but you know, the, the seeking of, and the, the whole topics around it. Um, and I, I don't know what is, you know, productizable in that space, so to speak, but I can totally see as I mature in, in years and decades, you know, my life going into those, those spaces potentially more. Um, and so, you know, and I think, is this my calling? I think not necessarily my calling. I think more like my, um, like big step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. One of the things that from our conversation that I'm picking up a lot on is that you're constantly absorbing, whether it's intentional by having the podcast guests, whether it's learning from your father, both good and negative mm -hmm. in terms of asking for help for when you need it to, you know, listening to podcasts, listening to books, to kind of finding something out that you don't know. Mm. And, but also, and you know, going to a psychologist with Joel, your, you know, your business partner. So, and in, even in the, the way that you hire people where it's not just your own opinion, but also taking on board other people who have gone through it or, you know, what's the best way of doing that. So not just being completely self-reliant and you do engage other people quite a lot. And I think that's quite, for me, that's one of the biggest thing that stands out to me about you mm. in terms of what I think has been the reason for your success, because you're very, very good at tapping into the knowledge of other people. Mm. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer. I mean, it all comes to me, all, everything comes, everything comes down to neuroplasticity. So this is the brain's ability to change itself. Um, when I first read about neuroplasticity, I was like, oh, that's the thing. Um, and basically the concept is your brain is plastic. It molds as you age. And the only thing that molds it are your surroundings. So basically your choices. So whether you have a shitty brain that like, you know, means you sit on the sofa all day, you watch Netflix, you blame everyone else for your problems, like all of these things. Um, prior like prior psychological understanding um uh, freudian is you're stuck with a brain you're born with and that was then disproved through neuroscience uh through brain scans that discovered neuroplasticity and it's like actually no and the field of positive psychology started by a guy called martin seligman which actually i became really obsessed with when i started 
um, in this whole brain mental health space. I learned about Martin Seligman. I saw him do a talk. I read his books. I enrolled in his course at University of Pennsylvania, which was like an online course thing. Got my diploma in positive psychology, which, you know, is one of those, you know, do it in three months kind of thing. It's not that impressive. Um, and I love this idea that actually, no, you're not stuck with a brain you're born with whatsoever. Like absolutely every single person has unlimited human potential is just a choice of what you wake up and decide to do that day. How do you fill your brain? And then how do you reflect on what's filling your brain? And then how do you make different choices? Um, little by little, it completely, you know, you you can get the same person and scan their brain in their 20s. And based on their choices, you could look at someone have completely different brain shape um, in their 30s based on the decisions that they've chosen to make. And so sometimes in life, if you're unfortunate, you know, people, let's say you're from an underprivileged background, right? People might lim give you, like impose their self-limiting beliefs on you and tell you you'll never amount to nothing and all of these things and force you into certain situations. And that becomes their reality because they choose to listen. But you also hear these really inspiring stories on podcasts of people that break free from that and have the life that's completely different to everyone else they grew up with. And all the difference is they chose to make their own decisions and do those things. So I guess the reason I'm saying this is because you know, to your point, I fundamentally super strongly believe in the idea of input equals output. So what I choose to allow into my brain and what I choose to say yes to and what I choose to say no to, all of these things are every single day physiologically changing the shape of my brain and determining who I'm going to be next year, in five years, in 10 years. And so anyone is capable of doing that, but I just so strongly believe in it. So I love to absorb information. Um, like I said, I'm really purposeful about my books. I have loads of, there's loads of downsides to this, by the way. I, you know, I get ripped on by plenty of people. I don't listen to fiction. You know, and I would have wasted my time. It's not a waste of my time. Of course it's not. It's a great thing to listen to fiction, but I'm like hungry for another business book, hungry for another psychology book, hungry for another neuroscience book. So, you know, you can also become really one dimensional with this point of view. Mm. Um, I but, actually tried to read a, a fiction book myself. I'm exactly like you. Mm. I forced myself to read it and I just did not enjoy it. I predicted the end at the very beginning. Yeah. And I'm like, maybe I have to go and read the classics. I, I love don't films. Know. Mm. So, you know, I'm not like completely devoid to like watching, <laughs> watching fiction, yeah. but I'm just like, you know, I've got limited time walking every day with my ears. I'd rather just try and learn something new. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, the other point is on self-help books, for example. So self-help books get really bad rep. Um, in general, people think they're a massive waste of time, etc. My view on them is I think they're great um, because it's all about your mindset. You come at it with a cynical mindset, you will think they're crap. And you come at it with an open mindset you'll start to think they're crap, but you know, if you repetition, you'll start to realize they make more sense. And actually, self-help books all say the same thing. Like they all say the same thing. Basically, they're all based on stoicism, one way or another. Um, and the fundamental truth of any self-help book is long term over short term. Now you don't need to read any self-help books. What do you class as a self-help book? Good question. I guess anything that's on... Um, like mindset, life, you know, the sort of trying to give you uh, a way of life. I mean, a Jay Shetty is a self-help book. Stephen Bartlett's is a self-help book. Um, Roxy Nafusi, self-help, even Rung and Chatterjee's books, you know, they're self-help, you know, and it can be health and, health and wellness or psychology. But they're all kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. They just are. But then so is Marcus Aurelius Meditations. It's the ultimate original self-help book because it's like the original, one of the original Stoic books. Um, all of those books, if you study them, they say the same thing. They just say, long term, be patient. Um, however, the reason I continue to read them over and over again, even though I know they're the same message repackaged different ways, I'm an impatient guy. <laughs> Aren't we all? Right? And so... I can read the things as many times as I like, but do my behaviors model the perfect person yet? Answer is no. I've now read hundreds of books. Am I perfect? No. Have I absorbed all that information? Absolutely not. You know, so much of it is so clearly in one ear and out the other because I'm not living that perfect life yet. Mm -hmm. I'm so distractible. I, you know, have terrible focus, like in the moment for stuff, you know, all of the things I'd love to be better at and perfect at, I'm not. I'm like massively fallible and have loads and loads and loads of um, 
you know, very common, irritating personal traits that I try to make better. Um, so my answer to all of these things is like, hey, you can stop reading self-help books or any of those types of things once you've mastered them. So like spirituality books, you know, they also say the same thing, basically, you know, it doesn't need to be a god. It's about connecting to nature and each other and listening to your body and taking space. I know all this stuff, but do I live all this stuff? Absolutely not. Mm. Because... You know, I'm walking around Angel, your beautiful area, and I'm like, what a beautiful house. How much is that? I'd love to own that. What a nice car. You know, have all the material thoughts that a truly enlightened and spiritual person has no need for. Yet that's what I'm reading. I'm sitting here reading Eckhart Tolle being like, yeah, no, oh, you're so right. You're so right. And I'm straight into Angel looking into the shops being like, oh, that's lovely in that. So if only there was a way to just switch off that right. negative self-talk or Absolutely. just like jumping from one thing to the other. And if like only this... there was a way to switch on and be perfect. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's it takes a lifetime's amount of work. Mm -hmm. And I actually quite enjoy the battle I have inside with myself about this, you know? I'm, I'm just as um, intrinsic material, intrinsically materialistic and shamefully consumerist as everyone else, but I'm constantly working at not being. Well, it's having this self-awareness, right? It's about recognizing that rather mm. than just being a complete passenger when it comes to just, you know, riding that wave. Mm. I think there is something to it Yeah, for, I mean, for me, for sure. No, I think mm. there is, and you know, Again, the, you know, on the concept of ego, for example, you know, it starts from self-awareness. It doesn't, I mean, first it doesn't end, you know, maybe it does if you're a monk, but I mean, this is kind of the point, right? That's why monks take themselves to monasteries in the middle of well, nowhere with nothing. It takes years, because decades. It takes years and decades, but it also takes removing everything else from your environment because that's how hard it is. So, you know, it's a ever ongoing process that's worth working towards but um, I don't. I don't necessarily, like I say, expect to get to an end point of pure enlightenment. I think that's you know maybe too much to ask for. So the fun part of the journey is like making sure that I bring that into the more you know shameful parts of my existence. Mm. And shameful to me. I'm not saying shameful to other people, but mm. parts I wish I was a better person at. Do you do you have that where you wish you were? Definitely. You know, better person. How often does that creep in? It's usually around things like consumerism mm. in general. Um, and I train myself well, um, broadly speaking. It's hard being a dad because um, then you start to <laughs> gravitate towards uh, ease and comfort. You know, because actually a lot of the times consumerism is you know shortcut you know a lot of things you're buying is kind of just you know and why is money so helpful it's a shortcut for ease you can do everything without money but you just have a much harder time you can live in the street i mean read the patagonia founder story it's amazing mm. um you know that guy was grinding squirrels in a tin to eat and survive in california i'm not sure i want that life so <laughs> you know yeah he's like that is his story is amazing it's the he is the most authentic person you could imagine to run a company like that that the world knows over mm -hmm. and i'm just not at that level i'm i'm not going to choose mm. to not have a roof over my head and eat squirrels in a tin thank you very much so i'm relatively far away from i suppose one person's version of what that really means to be free-spirited and non-consumerist. Um, but on the other side, you know, I do, um, you know, I do think sometimes when I, you know, make certain purchasing choices, I'm like, well, did I really need that? I know I didn't need that. I have enough. Um, but I did it anyway. Mm. And I think this, I, I, I always like to reflect on that one thing, which is enough. Mm -hmm. Enough is like the magical, it's the magical word. Um, and I think that's a really, really hard psychological battle to play as an entrepreneur that wants to create a big business mm. because it's counterintuitive. Have you read the book, The Molecule of More no. about dopamine? I highly recommend it because mm. the author writes incredibly well and about how dopamine rules our life effectively yeah. Yeah. and it's the the molecule of more of wanting to have more and it's intrinsic to our human being nature mm. but and it's also the one that makes us not satisfied with what we've got mm. which is you very very useful but in the lives that we lead when we have so much around that us and we live in abundance 
it also leaves us with feeling empty and not getting that satisfaction. Yeah. So for me, it's fascinating of how do you, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as you know, a person that is ambitious, who wants to grow and develop and achieve, how can you do that while still being satisfied when you reach at least certain points in your life? Yeah. And I think that is the key to success because yeah. if you're never satisfied well, what, what what kind of a life is that yeah but i mean most people aren't satisfied right they're not no but and and, and like that's you know eckhart tolly says you know which i think is spot on you know if you're not happy with a million pounds you won't be happy with 10 million pounds because you in both scenarios you still want more and so wanting is the disease mm -hmm. like and unless you can totally tackle your understanding of wanting to having you will never ever ever find that point of satisfaction it's it's literally impossible um and so you always attach new meaning to the next thing and to the next thing but it's you know it's always going to be fleeting mm -hmm. and so you know the only way of practically and by practically i mean by creating a daily practice which is what i do practically trying to bring myself more grounded for these things is practicing gratitude so i mentioned martin seligman earlier you know he also he um has scientifically proven that the art of um gratitude with the three things which is three things i'm grateful for today before you go to sleep every day that is scientifically proven to improve your mental health across a whole range of different um, facets. But it's very simple gratitude practice, it takes under five minutes and trains your brain, neuroplasticity again, to spend the time reflecting on the things that were good in the day and how that has helped you. Um, that is one of the only practices that I've understood that can slowly chip away at wanting. Do you do it every day? Yeah, I've done it every day mm. since I did his course, basically. So I've done it every day for about four years. Mm. Um, and I do it with my wife. It's like our bedtime practice every single night. Um, and it's amazing practice on, it's a good practice on good days. Um, you know, three nice things. You know, I hung out with Maria today. Like you, you pick three things and it's really obvious, but it's amazing when you've had a bad day. Mm. like a terrible day mm -hmm. like the worst day you've had in two years and you still have to, go you have to, to bed like and really dig deep things. in your brain to find that and in those moments you actually you really find your humanity because mm -hmm. you actually can't think of anything today and so you're like i, I had running thing. water around my tap mm -hmm. i woke up today mm -hmm. i had a meal and you're like shit some people don't have those three things mm -hmm. that's pretty powerful and you have like you know you sit there writing this thing, thinking about it. And you're like, that's actually kind of amazing because every other day, like, look how much I take for granted. Mm. Uh, but right now I'm like forced to think about the three most basic human things that I have actually had today with great ease. And I could afford a sandwich at lunch. You know, you're really like, it's really fascinating. So, and those are like quite spiritual moments because at those moments you actually think about how you're connected to other people and how other people don't have those things. Something that you said before about, I think it was passion is for you and purpose is for others. Mm. And one of the things from my own experience is, is travel, which takes you out of your day to day. And especially if you're traveling to a not first world country where you see how other people mm. live, and that is one humbling experience mm. when you begin to see it's actually, you know, and I, and I had that when you spend so much time in your own surroundings that you actually forget how yeah. other people live. And it's so important to connect with that. And I think we can be very, it's very easy to just shut off what's going on mm. in the rest of the world and just be so focused on self. How has be becoming a father shaped mm. you as a person and as an entrepreneur? So interestingly, becoming a father has um, created the first ever um, like end of day for me, which is just weird. So <laughs> I just worked. I know what you mean. Yeah, I just worked. And so, yeah. and I love working as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm very conscious, like I don't like to, you know, I've had burnout. So I'm very conscious of like my messages and I don't want to do hustle porn or anything, but it is hard when you're really passionate about what you do and you absolutely love it. Like it doesn't feel like extra work quite often. And so there are just plenty of times where you don't even realize it's nine o'clock, right? And you're just doing it because you're in the flow and whatever. 
That just does not happen because um, my working day finishes at six, whatever happens, and I'm home at 6.15. I work from home, it's worth saying. I don't just work 15 minutes from my house <laughs> in general. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, you know, like all my answers, slightly longer one, but very briefly, I, uh, in my company, we do OKRs, objectives and key results as like our way that we work from management. Um and with a few friends last year, I worked on my personal OKRs. So what are personal objectives and key results I want to achieve over the next year? And I just become a dad. And the most important thing to me, so I was writing out all of the things. And the most important thing was I want to be an amazing dad. So then you start to work. That's the objective. So then what are the key results? Well, I mean, she's basically just born. So she's like a potato. Um, so how do you look after a potato that's growing in sentience every day, but, you know, only only a tiny bit? Um, so I was like, okay, well, look, these are the fundamental things as far as I understand from other dads and other mums. Um, you know, I want to be around. So that means that, like, I'm fully committing to remote. Um, I want to do bath time every day. I want to do... Um, wake up every day and I want to do so basically I was like you know I, I'm going to design my work life or my routine day around my daughter so get some good routines for her but also because I know the number one complaint from dads who go to the office is they miss every bath time and you also have to leave early so you don't get to do the wake up stuff so I was like that has got to be the benefit of working from home so every single morning I take my daughter at 7 a.m. and, you know, things have changed. Now she's in nursery finally, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> so I actually get some work done. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, until then, it was like basically 7 till 9, 30, 10 every single day. I'll spend time with her. And then we do lunch. Then I do dinner. Well, I do bath time at 6.15 and then dinner. Um, why that's really interesting is because then it's so clear to me suddenly how many hours in the day I actually have to work. Um, that is like fascinating because suddenly I'm like a machine. I will get the stuff done that I have to get done because I know when it hits 6.15, I'm doing that bar time. Um, there is just no, I mean, the, you know, and the other thing that's good about this routine is I'm then very picky about, you know, am I going for dinner and this thing or am I doing that? Like suddenly I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do a dinner a month or something like that for work. But I don't want to do more because I wrote to myself what I wanted to do already and I'm scoring myself. So mm. I want to look at the end of the year and be like, I nailed that. I'm super proud of it. The same way I would with company OKRs. So in answer to your question, um, I've become way more regimented, which has been good. Um, I actually think I've probably been more productive at work. Um, I've had a like going home time, which I've just never had like in 10 years, basically, of being an entrepreneur. It's the first time I've been like, sorry, got to go, 6.15, bye. It's fascinating. Mm. So that's been great. Um, on the other side, yeah, I'm a bit tired, sometimes grouchy, <laughs> sure. Um, oh, the I've also realized that nursery is the biggest scam in the world because it's basically just a place for your kids to get sick and then you're paying for them to go to nursery, but they're at home with you and now they're sick. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's been a good insight. I've, I've realized what I think the best business model in the world is, and it's that. It's where you pay for your child to get sick so they can't go. It's very <laughs> clever. It's very clever. Mm. Not sure it's got all the evil intentions I'm giving it out to be, but yeah, I'm, I'm learning what every other parent has realized over time. Mm. Yeah, it's like three days in, two days sick. Okay, great. Glad I'm paying for all five days then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the experience that mothers go through. I mean, it's what is really refreshing is to hear your perspective because it is flipping that idea of like, well, you know, I'm going out, you know, earning a living, being mm -hmm. the main breadwinner and, you know, we'll stay up late, go traveling and do all the sorts of dinners. But actually, you know, giving that priority to the family and how you have to kind of shift the way that you work in yeah. order to accommodate that. But also what's fascinating is that it does make you much more focused mm -hmm. where every single minute that you do has to count yeah. because you are prioritizing your kind of you know your your other time towards something that you have yourself chosen yeah. to do and it makes it easier to say no yes um and i don't use my daughter as an excuse like i can't wait to use that by the way i'm not above that i'm definitely <laughs> going to be doing that non-stop but at the moment it's just like can you do this thing i'm like no why not mm -hmm. i don't have time mm -hmm. because i know how many hours in the what uh, in the day i have to do my work at heights and it's not that many so it makes it really easy for me to say no to other stuff whereas before i was you know 
happy to work through in the night. Well, if I'm happy to work through in the night, I have an extra three or four hours, so I can do other things like as well, and I can fit it all in. Now I just can't. Um, and then, you know, with my wife as well, you know, she goes into the office. So I actually, you know, we do a good split, but I do more of the um, nursery pickups and drop-offs as well. And so, again, if I'm doing something like this today, for example, I know I'm not there for the nursery pickup. And so that's like a, you know, a, a, an exemption. But in general, it's just about trying to like fit the things mm. that work quite well. And I quite like the opportunity as well to be like stay at home dad. Mm. Feel like I need a t-shirt, <laughs> like super dad style. Yes. Yeah. Or a mug. Or a mug, yeah, maybe a mug. <laughs> but I'm definitely I'm owning this uh, mm. this this dad vibe. I really like it. Mm. How has being a dad shaped you as a leader? Probably much worse because I'm probably just grumpy. <laughs> Um, I don't know about shape me as a leader, if I'm honest, because I feel like my main leadership lessons came from, um, uh, came from failing. Um, so they came more from feeling like I need all the answers to being better at asking questions. Um, and the one thing that I have done, you know, is I've really invested in like learning how to be a coach. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm very much like team coach learning, you know, going from sort of management -y style questions to more coaching questions and spending the time upskilling myself. I get coaching on being a coach and I get to spend time coaching. Um, so, you know, from the parenthood side. Well, Margot's still quite, quite small. That's kind of what I mean. So she's you're not really kind of she's directing no. quite I'll let yet. you know when she starts walking. She yeah. almost, almost took a first step today, but then she fell oh, over. So, yeah. you know, not quite there. Nearly. <laughs> nearly, nearly. When she can start telling me that I'm wrong about everything and, you know, having oh. opinions for herself, then I'll come back to you on how it's made me a good leader. Yeah, maybe we should have a follow-up in a couple of years yeah, and exactly. see how you're getting on then exactly. and what your sleep looks like then because That's my sleep saying. hasn't She's just an adorable much. potato. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the questions I always ask at the end is this impossible question, which is, if you could achieve anything... Or something that seems impossible to you now mm. that will change the course of your life or your business. What would that be? Being able to read on Audible 5x speed, but <laughs> still understanding everything that's being said. That would be quite a good superpower. In that fairness. is a good superpower. Um, is that the right kind of spirit of the answer? Or do you want something more serious? No, whatever it comes to your mind, really. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think in fairness... Um, I would, I would, you know, we were speaking about it earlier, like content creation and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like, so I you want to be on saying, TikTok. Is that, is that the not goal? Not necessarily <laughs> TikTok. I, I, I think YouTube, mm. you know, so I genuinely, I do believe the thing is, I do believe in the power of content creation and I do believe in video. And I think all this stuff is really important and it's such a great skill. Um, it's just finding the time and the intrinsic motivation to do it. And I think if you can become really good at that. I really do genuinely believe you can have a massively positive impact in the world. Um, I believe in the idea of, you know, uh, people following interesting people with opinions to share and opportunities to make them think and all of this different stuff. So I'm really into that. I just haven't found my groove in it. And like quite the opposite, as I said, you know, I, I sometimes think I might have the spark of a groove and then I like hide away from it for weeks mm. on end. So I know that's my biggest growth opportunity. I just, um, and, and I think that that could really help Heights. I think it could help me. I hopefully think that I have interesting stuff to share so it could help other people. Um, I just, I'm not there yet. So I think that would be like the one thing that maybe could have the biggest exponential mm. benefit that I'm not currently doing. Well, you said that you like to do, you know, to kind of like immerse yourself into something and that's like, that's the 10 years. So maybe the next five years is this sort of, you know, YouTube, social media, or maybe... Who knows what's going to be in the next five years as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I just got a massive aversion for faff and watching <laughs> anyone do any video stuff as we've seen. And not just you, everyone. Yeah. Everyone. There's just so much faff involved with videoing. So, yeah, you know, I, mean, I respect that's... the patience. It does get easy after a while. I think it's the beginning that's the most painful when you don't really know what you're doing or how you want it to be. And then you're not really as skilled in that. Mm. So, you know, you're very good at finding people who do you know, who do yeah. good things. Yeah. Maybe that's, maybe that's the route. I have to train Margot. Well, there you go. There you, go. you have to start My them young. I mean. <laughs> yeah, when every daughter wants to be told what to do by their dad. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming onto the show. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. And yeah, I mean, I had like two pages of questions and I think we might have covered one. maybe not even one, but um, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.